Welcome back, today on The Joseph Carlson Show. The major indices have performed well this year, with the S&P 500 and the QQQ making major gains. But these gains are being led by a handful of companies. We can see the overall map here of the S&P 500 year to date. We have some of the bigger names like Microsoft, Apple, Google, Meta, Amazon, Costco, Eli Lilly, Broadcom, all making huge gains year to date. But there's one company that really stands out that's already a large company. That is NVIDIA, which is up 160% year to date. That is an astronomical return for a company the size of NVIDIA. NVIDIA alone has accounted for roughly one third of the S&P 500 gains year to date. Meaning that if you took away this company from the S&P 500, the S&P 500 would have returned around 11% instead of 17%. That's how big of an impact NVIDIA alone has had. It's really been breathtaking. It's been astronomical. Anytime a company has this large of an influence, this much attention, and this much momentum, I think it's important to look at it from a value investor perspective. And that's what I plan to do in this video. I'm gonna go out on a limb a bit. I'll be giving the bear case for Nvidia and why I personally believe this is an incredibly risky company to invest in today. Now we also of course have some other news to get to. Ed Yardini from Yardini Research gives his opinion on the market melt-up. Boeing just agreed to plead guilty to the 737 MAX criminal case. We'll be observing more of the downfall of Boeing and the collapse of their company's culture and Paramount Global and Skydance finally formally agreed to a merger. We'll be looking at how that impacts Paramount stock. Now I first want to start off by giving my bear case on Nvidia and I want to start off by first prefacing this bear case. Anytime I give a bear case on any popular stock, one like Nvidia, there's a lot of risk to it. The risk, of course, is that the stock races up after you release your bear case. Now, I don't have any position in Nvidia. I'm not short Nvidia. I have no options or no position whatsoever on Nvidia. So there's no financial risk with being bearish on Nvidia for me. In fact, if Nvidia stock races upwards tomorrow after releasing this video, I'm not out anything. I haven't really lost anything. I own a high quality portfolio full of companies that are doing fantastic. My performance has been great over the past couple of years. So I don't have any issue if Nvidia continues to do well. And that's not my motivation behind making this video. The reason that I come out with bear cases on popular stocks is because I see a lot of retail investors investing in the market and they throw their money into whatever's doing best at the moment. There's a post on Reddit just today saying my dad invested $200,000 into Nvidia last week, and he's saying he could hold it for the next three years. What are your thoughts? Good investment? These are the type of posts we're seeing now with Nvidia. People's dads throwing $200,000 into the stock just to hold it for a couple of years and see how things go. And this type of thing is to be expected. Nvidia's phenomenal performance this year brings a lot of attention to the stock, which increases the chance of retail investors pouring money into this company, for better or worse. A lot of this is due to recency bias. Recency bias is a normal thing. Most of us have this. It just means that we give more attention to recent events over historical events. And recently, the best stock in the market is Nvidia, by far. This also seems to follow another pattern. Investors clamor into stocks that have recently had incredible outperformance, and then they go on for years having underperformance. One of the best examples of this is Tesla, a stock that has been flat for over three and a half years. To this day, even after this recent rally, Tesla stock still trades below where it was in 2020, and well below where it was at the price point in early 2021. I made similar videos on Tesla at the time, calling out the insanity of ARK Invest's $3,000 price target for Tesla. In that video, I argued that Apple is a much better opportunity than Tesla given the valuation and the fundamentals. Since that video, Tesla is still under the price point that it traded at three and a half years ago when I released that video. Apple has increased by over 80%. Now, I didn't come out with that video because I hate Tesla and want it to fail. I came out with a video to highlight a stock that was incredibly popular, being promoted by many popular figures, saying that the demand for Teslas was unlimited. It would go on forever, saying that they were selling every vehicle they made and their margins were going to march higher and higher and higher. And they weren't gonna run into any problems with their moat or competition. All of these things being said about Tesla, how the company could not fail, and how the stock justified the extreme valuations made me increasingly nervous about the company. Another very popular retail stock that I've given a bear case on 
is Palantir. Three years ago, during peak bullishness for Palantir, at a time point where Palantir was doing incredibly well, I had a poor cold water on the situation. I released a video called why I'm not buying Palantir. I went over the business fundamentals, the growth prospects, and the valuation, expressing my concern that Palantir traded at an incredibly high valuation. That video was released February 19th, 2021. The stock price at the time was $29 per share, and even three and a half years later, Palantir still does not to this day trade above that price. Now again, Tesla and Palantir are both great companies. I'm not against what they're doing or the companies themselves. In fact, I could see myself investing in them with the right situation. But both of these stocks got into situations where good companies made poor investments. So the purpose of making these bear case videos is not to bet against these companies or profit from their demise. It's to give a different perspective for retail investors that see these as fantastic investments. In many cases, great companies can make poor investments if you invest in the company at the wrong time. And with Nvidia, I think it's very questionable. In fact, I think it's very risky to invest in it at this time. The first thing that we can point to is how Nvidia makes money. Simply put, where do they get their revenue from? As I've gone over previously on this channel, they get their revenue from data centers. That is where the majority of their revenue and growth is coming from. It's not coming from gaming, professional visualization, or automotive. These are nice parts of the company. I guess they're meaningful to some degree, but as you can see, all three of these combined are still less in revenue than they were in 2021. So the growth is not coming from these three segments. It's all coming from data centers. Nvidia is in the business of providing chips for data centers. These chips are massive. In fact, they're more like entire server racks instead of chips. And these chips are expensive, some of them being $30,000 and upwards for a single chip. Nvidia has dominated the data center chip business, growing it exponentially over the past year, from $4 billion in revenue up to above $20 billion in revenue. And it's still growing. And while the revenue has grown and the margins have expanded, the free cash flow has also exponentially expanded. Here's the free cash flow of Nvidia since 1999. You can barely see the amount of free cash flow it made up until 2021. You see a little bit right here. It was doing good in 2021. And then you have the explosive growth, earning $15 billion in free cash flow in a single quarter. This puts it on track to earn $60 billion in free cash flow this year. The returns on capital employed, a measurement of how effectively a company can reinvest its cash that it earns, is also increasing exponentially. This was a metric that was not reliable historically for Nvidia. It had it in the 5% range, which is on par with companies like Ford or GM. And then it went up into the 15% range, which that's getting closer to companies like Costco, very reliable and predictable companies. But then it ebbed and flowed over time. Now over the past year, the returns on capital employed have surged upwards of 27%. This is a 5x of the returns on capital employed. Gross margins are expanding, but more importantly, operating margins have doubled their historical average over the past five years, racing up to 65%. Profit margins are now around 57%. Whatever metric you look at, you can tell that business is good for Nvidia, and specifically the data centers. But that raises the question of duration. How long can Nvidia sustain these type of metrics and this type of growth? Sequoia Capital released research looking into this question. They call it AI's $200 billion question. The generative AI wave, which began last summer, has gone into hyperspeed. The catalyst for this double acceleration was Nvidia's Q2 earnings guide and subsequent beat. This signaled to the market the insatiable level of demand for GPUs and AI training. Before Nvidia's announcement, consumer launches like ChatGPT, Midjourney, and Stable Diffusion had raised AI into the public consciousness. With Nvidia's results, founders and investors were delivered empirical evidence that AI can generate billions of dollars in net new revenue. This has shifted the category into its highest gear yet. We've seen all of this over the past two years, ChatGPT and Nvidia's quarters leading to incredible gains by the company, the stock price going up 10x over the past couple of years. While investors have extrapolated much of Nvidia's results and AI investments are now happening at a torrid pace and at record valuations, a big open question remains. What are all these GPUs being used for? Who is the customer's customer? How much value needs to be generated for this rapid rate of investment to pay off? How is all of this spending being justified? Consider the following. For every $1 spent on GPUs, roughly $1 needs to be spent on energy costs to run the GPU 
in a data center. So if Nvidia sells $50 billion in run rate GPU revenue by the end of the year, a conservative estimate based on analyst forecasts, that implies approximately $100 billion in data center expenditures. The end user of the GPU, for example, Starbucks, X, Tesla, GitHub, Copilot, and other new startups need to earn a margin too. Let's assume that they need to earn 50% margins. This implies that for each year of current GPU CapEx, $200 billion of lifetime revenue would need to be generated by the GPUs to pay back the upfront capital investment. This does not include any margin for cloud vendors. For them to earn a positive return, the total revenue requirement would be even higher. So the argument that Sequoia is making here is basically for Nvidia to be selling $22 billion worth of data center chips and GPUs, someone needs to be making money on those sales. It can't just be the cloud companies buying these chips that need to make money. The cloud company's customers also need to make money in the process. Based on public filings, much of the incremental data center build out is coming from big tech companies. Google, Microsoft, and Meta, for example, have reported increased in data center capex. Reports indicate that ByteDance, Tencent, Alibaba are big NVIDIA customers as well. On a go forward basis, companies like Amazon, Oracle, Apple, Tesla should also be important contributors. The important question to be asking is how much of this CapEx build out is linked to true end customer demand and how much of it is being built out in anticipation of end customer demand? This is a $200 billion question. If you add up the different companies and how much they're expecting to generate in AI revenue, you have OpenAI generating $1 billion in revenue. You have Microsoft saying that they're going to generate around $10 billion with Microsoft Copilot. We can assume that Google will generate around similar amounts of revenue from their AI products. Meta and Apple will each generate $10 billion in revenues from AI. And let's use $5 billion as a placeholder from Oracle, ByteDance, Alibaba, Tencent, X, and Tesla. These are all dummy assumptions, but the point is that even if you assume these extremely generous gains from AI, there's still a $125 billion hole that needs to be filled for each year of CapEx at today's level. Sequoia goes on to argue that this leaves a huge gap to be filled, and that gap will be filled by startup companies. Startup companies will benefit from the overbuilt ecosystem of AI. They'll leverage cloud companies and their huge infrastructure to be able to offer AI products to their customers at very low expense. They note that during historical technology cycles, overbuilding of infrastructure has often incinerated capital. Bringing down the marginal cost of AI is good for startup companies, but where does that leave Nvidia? Nvidia is benefiting directly from being the leader in AI chips during a time where there's this insatiable demand for AI chips. But as we've seen, and as they note, in many cases that leads to it being overbuilt, meaning that too many companies race to become the AI leaders, they buy too many chips, and then they're left overbuilding their infrastructure. In this case, the estimates are somewhere around $125 billion, even from optimistic assumptions from their biggest customers. If smaller startup companies are not able to fill in those gaps, then Nvidia could be left with a glut in demand. A glut in demand would affect every meaningful fundamental of the company. So my first major concern with Nvidia right now is the possibility of an overbuilt AI infrastructure. If that takes place and they eventually have a glut in demand, that glut in demand will lead to declining or decelerating fundamental metrics. And that leads us to concern number two. There's two different setups to a stock. One that I consider to be the perfect situation and one that I consider to be the worst situation. I always try to find companies that lean more to this left side, more to the perfect situation because it leads to outperformance. Of course, the worst situation often leads to underperformance. So let's go ahead and go through this. Under the perfect ideal situation for the setup of a stock, you want a company that has accelerating revenue growth. Now, accelerating revenue growth does not mean a company that's growing revenue. A company may grow revenue 10% year over year over year. That company does not have accelerating revenue growth. A company that has accelerating revenue growth means the rate of growth is increasing year over year. So one year it's growing 5% and then suddenly it's growing 10% or 15% or 20%. It's great for companies to have continually growing revenue, but it's incredible if a company can have accelerating revenue growth, especially when it's unexpected. Now we also have the same thing here with earnings growth. We have accelerating earnings growth. Again, this doesn't mean that they're earning the same amount every year. It means that they're earning at an increased rate every year. 
these type of companies typically lead to outperformance. We also have expanding margins. If the company has accelerating revenue growth, accelerating earnings per share growth, and expanding margins at the same time, that is a win, win, win. That is a situation where your stock is going to go up almost definitely. In fact, every situation that I've seen this with a stock, the stock price goes up. And then finally, to cap this off, the perfect situation in my opinion is when you get accelerating revenue growth, earnings growth, and margin expansion tied together with a low starting valuation, an undemanding valuation to start things off, leading to multiple expansion over time. A company that fit this situation was Netflix two years ago. At one point, investors were so bearish on Netflix that they traded the stock down to around $170 per share, right below $200 per share for a couple of months. During this time period, Netflix had a 15 forward PE ratio. It was a lower multiple than the market. Netflix had a low starting valuation, leading to multiple expansion. Netflix went from a 15 forward PE ratio now back up to a 36 forward PE ratio. During this time period two years ago, Netflix had accelerating revenue growth. Netflix's flat revenue in 2021 is what caused the 70% sell-off in the stock. Many investors thought the company was done for because the revenue was going down. But then we had a reacceleration in revenue that reignited investors' bullishness on the stock. Accelerating revenue caused the multiple to expand. All of these factors of accelerating revenue growth, earnings, margin expansion, and a low starting multiple led to an incredible return for this stock. From this point, Netflix is up 267%. This incredible return is a result of this perfect situation. But then we move on to the worst situation. We have decelerating revenue growth. We have decelerating earnings per share growth. We have margin compression with margins going down. We have a high starting valuation with very high expectations from investors leading to multiple compression over time. The worst situation is the exact opposite of the perfect situation. And if we ask the important question here, which situation does Nvidia stock appropriately fit into right now? I think we can take a look at that. The first question is regarding revenue. Nvidia has benefited dramatically from accelerating revenue growth. We've seen that over the past year, but that is not going to happen over the next year. NVIDIA's revenue growth is going to decelerate quickly. NVIDIA's revenue growth is going from rates of 97% down to 30%. And from 30%, it's only going to decelerate more and more. So we have decelerating revenue growth. What about their earnings growth? The earnings per share has gone up 631% over the past year. It is impossible for Nvidia to keep these earnings growth rates up. It is going to decelerate dramatically over the next year. Margins is another big question, and there's a lot of debate about margins with Nvidia. We know that Nvidia stock has dramatically benefited from rising margins over the past year, but the question now is whether or not those margins are likely to continue going up or more likely to go down. If I have to take a guess here, with margins at 65% for something that every company is now trying to build out because of how profitable it is, I think the margins are more likely to go down over the next three years than up. There is a chance they could go up. Maybe Nvidia can protect their moat completely, but I have to believe there's more of a chance of margins going down than up. And then finally, the current valuation of the stock. Is it a low valuation that will lead to multiple expansion? or high starting valuation, leading to multiple compression. Nvidia currently has a 54 PE ratio and a 40 price to sales. This is a pretty high valuation, and if I'm looking at this stock right now, I think there's far more chance that it's going to have multiple compression over the next five years than multiple expansion. Maybe the PE ratio could go to 60 or 70, maybe the price to sales could go to 50, but overall, I see far more downside with their multiples than upside. So it's priced at a price right now with a high starting valuation and very high expectations from investors. When I look over the situation overall, I see a company that is likely to have decelerating revenue growth, decelerating earnings growth, margin compression, and it's at a pretty high valuation. Now that doesn't mean that the stock is doomed, Nvidia could do just fine, but it has a lot of factors working against it. It has a far more uphill battle than when it was in the situation two years ago where everything was accelerating, everything was expanding, and the valuation was lower. Again, it's impossible to see the future. Maybe Nvidia will continue to trade upwards with incredible demand, especially in the short term. But over the next three to five years, I have to look at this from the perspective of a value investor with the fundamentals, the valuation, and the future growth prospects of the company. And right now I see a lot of reasons to be a little bit concerned about this company more than to be extremely bullish on it. 
I consider it right now an incredibly risky proposition to invest in NVIDIA. The final point I'll make is something that I think is interesting to look at, and that is that overall insiders are selling shares of their stock. Not just their compensation through their stock-based comp, but they're actually unloading some of their position, especially over the past month. NVIDIA insiders have been selling around 1% of their stake in the company just in the past month alone, which is not a huge deal. In fact, I don't consider this overall that big of a deal in and of itself, and I'd never make a bear case on a company centered around insiders taking some gains. So in and of itself, I don't think that this is too big of a problem, but when I'm looking overall at the stock and the situation right now, I think it's just another thing to throw in, another thing to mention, because we do see insiders overall taking a bit of the gains here, I don't see any buys coming through with insiders. So there's my overall concerns about Nvidia and a different perspective on a stock that has been incredibly popular. Now let's go ahead and move on to some news here. We know the market has been going up over the past couple of weeks, seemingly every day, inching up inch by inch. And Ed Yardeni, who has a lot of information on the market, he publishes a lot of charts, says that this is a slow motion market melt up. I think the way I would describe things is we're in a slow motion melt up. Um, the market just uh, for the past few weeks has just continued to march higher to new record highs and it's done it on uh, disappointing economic indicators because I think investors have concluded that let's not worry too much about the, uh, the economy slowing or even a recession because if that were to uh, even become a, a significant uh, risk, the Fed will move pretty quickly to lower interest rates. I don't think the Fed needs to lower interest rates, but uh, the Fed looks like they're ready to lower them if necessary. Ed argues that the reason the market continues to go upwards despite weak economic data is because investors realize that the Fed is on their side and the Fed will lower interest rates if the economy ever runs into trouble. I don't agree with him here. I don't think that's the reason that most investors continue to buy. I believe most investors buy stocks repeatedly and continually and put money into their 401ks and retirement accounts because they're long-term investors, because they've been told their entire lives to buy the stock market and not worry if there's a recession. Eventually, it will recover. Most investors understand throughout history that we've gone through recessions. Most investors in America investing into their retirement accounts aren't trying to time the ebbs and flows of the market. So I think overall, the reason the market continues to go up, the reason that investors continue to buy, is because these companies are doing well, investors want to own them, and they're not concerned about the temporary question of a recession. Now moving on, Ed gets to his projections of what he thinks the earnings per share will be for the S&P 500 in 2024. Yeah, I, I think we're going to do $250 a share this year. That's up from $225 a share last year. I think uh, next year we're going to do $270 a share, then $300 a share. Uh, by the end of the decade, I think we could be looking at $400 a share. Um, Ed's forecast is for the S&P 500 to earn $250 by the end of the year. Tom Lee's was $285. So he's not quite as bullish as Tom Lee, but he still thinks that the earnings are going to be higher than the previous years. Now moving on, we have news that Boeing agrees to plead guilty in the 737 MAX criminal case. Boeing will formally acknowledge the guilt and accept fresh punishment over its dealings with the Federal Aviation Administration before two 737 MAX crashes that killed 346 people. As part of the plea to one count of conspiracy to defraud the U.S., prosecutors asked the company to pay a second $244 million criminal fine and spend $455 million over the next three years to improve its compliance and safety programs. Boeing also must hire independent monitors for three years to oversee these improvements. Pleading guilty creates business challenges for Boeing. Companies with felony convictions can be suspended or barred as defense contractors. Boeing is expected to seek a waiver for that consequence. The company was awarded Defense Department contracts last year valued at $22.8 billion. Also as part of this plea agreement, Boeing Board of Directors agreed to meet with victims' families. Now, when I look over this consequence for what Boeing did, I think they got a slap on the wrist. I think this is way below what their punishment should have been. Boeing didn't just get things wrong. They didn't just make an honest mistake. They intentionally and willfully put dangerous planes on the tarmac with passengers in it. They didn't do any proper checks before the second crash after they knew that something was dramatically wrong with the first one. This is what led to 346 people dying. 
around half of those people still could be alive if they properly identified the problem after the first plane crash. And not only did they not do the checks, but they also blamed the pilots after the crash. The CEO of the company went in a press conference and said that it was pilot error and that as far as they could tell, Boeing did nothing wrong. So they were victim blaming after this crash, which killed 346 people, when their planes and the faulty design of the MCAS system was the reason for the crash. The fact that Boeing is having to pay less than $1 billion. You have $244 million and then $455 million over the next three years is a complete miscarriage of justice here. That is a slap on the wrist for a company that made huge mistakes. Last year, Boeing made $4.4 billion in free cash flow. So that's not even one quarter of one year of free cash flow over the next three years. And this is the big penalty that Boeing's given. The plea deal falls short of what families of the max crash victims had wanted. They asked federal prosecutors to seek fines as high as around 25 billion. Now, $25 billion, I think, is a, is a lot of money. I could see them coming down from that number, but even having around $5 billion of fines would be a nice hefty punishment for Boeing. The fact that they brought it down all the way to around 600 million, 600, 700 million over three years, doesn't really send the message that I think the victims once sent. The companies are being held accountable and they're given real fines and penalties for this type of damage. What Boeing did was cause an incredible amount of destruction, killing 346 people, damaging the reputation of a great company, and making it so that people don't have confidence flying in their planes. That is an incredible amount of both immediate damage to the families involved and the brand damage of the company. And I think the penalty for this should have been much bigger. Now, finally, we also got news that the rumors are true. Paramount Global and Skydance agree to the merger. It's finally official. The rumors were fairly accurate. Skydance and its investors have agreed to spend more than $8 billion to acquire National Amusements. That is the family parent company that controls Paramount. Paramount stock is down 4% on the day. Not much has changed here. I believe the thesis for investing in Paramount has not changed since this acquisition. Now that's it for this episode. If you like this type of content and you want to see additional content, you can check out the Patreon membership. That also includes access to Qualtrum.com. Other than that, I'll see you next time.